So this morning, uh, Mike asked me to come and share my testimony with you guys. Now, some of you may have heard my testimony before. Some of you may have heard it in five short sentences for reality is. Some of you maybe heard a little five minute clip of my testimony. But this morning, I'm going to come and I'm going to tell you just about all that I can in the time that I have. Um, I didn't wake up and come out of the womb being a youth pastor. In fact, if you would have told me that five years ago, I would be a youth pastor sharing a sermon on Sunday morning, uh, serving in full-time ministry at Teen Challenge, I would have laughed at you. I would have thought that would be really funny because the way my life looked back then, this wouldn't have even been a possibility. And so as I share my testimony with you guys, I just want to show you the journey that God has brought me on and what he has taught me through everything that I've been through. And so as I go and I look at my testimony, one of the first places I always go back to look at was elementary school. And I don't know what you guys consider the hardest times of your life, but for me, elementary school was that time period for me. It was a really awkward stage in my life. Uh, home life was uh, pretty okay to start out. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up three houses down from our senior pastor. And so I was surrounded by the church from the time I was young. I went to every vacation Bible school I could have gone to, every summer camp. Every Wednesday night, me and my little brother would be taken to the church to be a part of youth group. On Sunday morning, we'd be there, and we'd be a part of church every single moment that we had the opportunity to be there. We were there. I had two Christian parents, Christian grandparents. Everything around my life was Christian to start out. Um, but in elementary school, that wasn't enough for me. That wasn't enough. You see, although both of my parents were Christian, my dad was an alcoholic. And I didn't know that when I was in elementary school. That wasn't something like, oh, yeah, dad's, dad's drunk. That's why he's so angry. You know, it wasn't something that I just knew, but I figured out over time that was the case. And so there were times where I remember being like six years old and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and Mom and Dad were yelling at each other, and I was sitting outside of my bedroom door and wanting to run into the bedroom to tell them to stop. But at 6 years old, uh, I didn't really have the strength to walk into that room. I wasn't brave enough. I wasn't strong enough, and I remember just sitting outside of that door. It was a scary place, and that was because of my dad's alcoholism. And school wasn't necessarily a sanctuary for me either. Um, being a kid, I always had the dream of growing up to be a jock. You know, I wanted to be an athlete. My mom was a four-time state champion swimmer. My dad was a great basketball and baseball player. And so growing up, I just had this competitive spirit inside of me. But uh, I just was never the greatest. I was always the shortest. I know that's hard for you guys to understand now because I'm so tall. But I was always the shortest. I was never really the fastest. I wasn't the most athletic. And so I'd get out there at recess, and all I wanted to do was go play basketball, kickball, football with the rest of the kids. But I was usually the last pick. I got made fun of a lot. And from a very early age, I started to learn very quickly that I wasn't good enough. And that lie was the very thing that defined me for the rest of my life. I'm not good enough. See, I was going to church all through this time. Like I said, our, we grew up three houses down from our senior pastor. And every Tuesday and Thursday night was kind of a fun night for us. We'd go over to pastor's house uh, and we'd sit down and watch American Idol. And we weren't just like casual fans. We were the American Idol fans where we'd print out pictures of the top 24 contestants. And each of us would take a different colored Sharpie and circle our favorite of who we wanted to win it all. And so I grew up surrounded by our senior pastor, grew up in church, and youth group was a really cool place for me. It was actually my safe place for a little while. You know, it was one of those places where I kind of felt like I fit in. I felt like I was actually starting to make some friendships, and those friendships didn't carry really outside of the church, but while I was in church, it was a pretty safe place. Until one day our youth pastor ended up getting a position as a senior pastor at another church. And slowly I started to watch all of these friendships that I had developed inside of the church, either follow him to go to the church where he now pastored, or some of them just stopped going to youth group. And that was kind of like my get out of jail free card. My dad at this time had already stopped really going to church as much. And so I used that as my motivation to kind of 
work my way out of going to church as much as I could. And so this is about 12 years old. 12 years old, I'm in middle school. And middle school seemed like it was going to be like this great escape. See, I grew up in the Waukee School District. It's not the uh, metropolis that it is now. It, when I was going to school there, it was a 3A school district. There were two elementary schools when I started out. I think there's as many as 10 plus elementary schools in Waukee now. It's pretty crazy. But there was three by the time I was completing fifth grade. And so as I was going into middle school, there were two other schools full of kids my age who I had the chance to meet. And I was like, if I don't make friends in this at this opportunity with twice as many kids for me to be able to interact with and build relationships with, then I might never make it. And so I'm 12 years old at the time, you know, really trying to figure out who I am and really trying to prove to myself that I'm good enough. I always wanted to prove that I was good enough. I never could just accept the fact that I am who God said I was, and I didn't even really know what that meant if you were to tell me that. I just knew that what I did defined who I was, and I didn't do a whole lot of anything good, so I wasn't that good. And so at 12 years old, I actually got invited to spend the night at one of my friend's houses, and it was one of those really weird experiences for me. When I got over to his house, as soon as my mom pulled out of the driveway, his mom and stepdad ended up heading off to go have a date night or something. And so it was just uh, me and my friend sitting there at his house by ourselves. He walked over to the fridge and pulled out a bottle of Bacardi. And I had a choice to make at that time. I knew drinking was wrong. At this point, I kind of understood what my dad was going through with alcoholism. But right there at the forefront of my mind, I knew that I wanted to fit in. And so if getting drunk and drinking with my friend was going to help me to fit in, then pour me as many shots as you can because I want to fit in as much as I can. And so at 12 years old, I got drunk for the first time. It was a few months away from that time, hanging out with that same friend that we ended up smoking weed. And so by 12 years old, I got introduced to alcohol and marijuana. And it wasn't something that was an everyday thing for me at that point. Um, it was once in a while, whenever somebody had something, uh, we'd get together and do it. But I noticed something real quick. As long as that I had weed or alcohol, all of a sudden I had a group of friends surrounding me who felt the same way about themselves as I did. And we became a band of brothers. And it wasn't about if we were athletes, it wasn't about if we were smart, it wasn't about anything. It was all about as long as we all screw up as much as we can together, then we have a group of friends and we're all going to be okay. So that's 12 years, 12 years old that I'm finding all this out. Now as I look at my home life, um, fast forward a couple years, I'm about 15 years old. And at home, things are really starting to shake up quite a bit. Um, my family sat down and we were having a meeting and in the living room and mom and dad sat me and my brother down to tell us that they were getting a divorce you know my dad's alcoholism had really come to a head you know he was in and out of treatment centers at this point went up to Detroit down to Texas went all over couldn't seem to get the alcohol kicked and um, it was time for them to separate because it just wasn't a good situation and so at that point my dad moved away and he ended up really out of my life for the next two years. Um, he moved down to Texas for a little while, ended up moving out to South Carolina, I guess, but he didn't really stay in touch very much. He didn't write letters, didn't talk to us, didn't come visit us. It was just kind of me against the world at that point is how I felt. Not only did I feel not good enough, but at this point in my life, I'm starting to feel abandoned and I'm looking for anybody that I can attach my life to. And so, it's at this point in time where I started to turn to the one thing that really made me feel better, and that was weed. And so at 15 years old, I start smoking weed pretty much every day, and I found out really quickly that it doesn't just like magically appear in your hand. You actually have to have money to be able to get it. And so I realized that I had to start selling it so that way I can continue to have more of it so I can stay high every day. And so I start figuring that out, and. As I started to buy more and more weed and meet more and more people, I ended up getting introduced to pills. And so I start doing those because once again, if I say no, then I'm not going to fit in. And if I don't fit in, then I'm not good enough. So I'm going to be a yes man and say yes to everything because I want you to like me. You liking me is my number one priority because I don't like myself. And so I have a girlfriend at this point. Natalie, close your ears. Uh, <laughs> 
I have a girlfriend at this point, and she wanted to help me try to sell some weed this day, and I was down to like my last gram, and she said, you know what, my sister over on the south side, uh, she wants to buy that from you. We just got to drive over there and drop it off, and I said, okay, let's go. And so we go over to the south side of Des Moines, we go into her apartment, and I walk into the bathroom to wait for them. It took like five minutes. I thought it was kind of weird, but I just kind of smoked a little bit while I waited for them to come. And eventually they do come in, and my girlfriend walks in hitting a meth pipe, and her sister follows in right behind her, sits down on the toilet, and starts shooting up right in front of me. Scared out of my mind, I had a decision because this was bigger and badder than anything that had ever come in front of me before. And it's one of those things you make a decision even while using. I'll do anything, but except for that meth stuff, except for heroin, except for these things, you know, those things you're too far gone. I ain't going to do those. But when push came to shove and I had a choice to make, was I going to fit in or was I going to be a scared little boy in a room full of women who were doing it? And I decided that I would rather be good enough for them and put dope into my body than to say no and be a nobody all over again. And so at 16 years old, I got myself hooked on meth and meth started to take over my life really quickly. I stopped going to school. I didn't care about anything anymore. Um, I even had a joke between we, me and one of my good friends. We'd get to school and we'd be like, do you think we can make it through three classes today? You think we can make it through two? Should we even go in the building at all, right? And eventually it's like, well, why would I even go to one class if I'm skipping the next seven, so I'm just not gonna go. And well, one of these days where I don't go, I'm really starting to become paranoid. Meth has a way of doing that to you. And I started to see these texts pop up on my girlfriend's phone and I start getting really concerned that she's gonna be cheating on me. And so she went to Woodward Granger, and so she went to a different school, or not Woodward Granger, she went to Woodward Academy. And so she got on a bus, going to get off, and I thought that she was going to be bringing her, uh, this guy she's been talking to, home with her. And so I meet them at Merle Hay Mall and end up following them all the way to her house. And as they're walking in the door, and as my paranoia is confirmed, uh, I walk in the door real fast right behind them, sprint into the kitchen, go and grab the sharpest knife that I can find, not to injure either of them, but to kill myself. And that was my intention that day. And so she and uh, this guy end up leaving. They don't say a word to me. They walk away. And I'm left inside of her house by myself with this knife. And I make about 11 cuts that day, one of them all the way to the bone. And I guess she must have called one of my friends, but he ends up sprinting through the door maybe 15, 20 minutes later, ends up finding me there, and calls 911, an ambulance, a fire truck, and a couple of policemen show up, and they come to take me away to the hospital, to the psych ward. They put some stitches in my arm, take me to the psych ward, and do a urinary analysis on me, and end up finding a bunch of drugs inside of my system, and they say, Michael... Uh, you don't need to be in the psych ward, you need to be in treatment. And I'm 17 years old at this point, and uh, I'm getting sent off to treatment. So I end up spending my junior and senior year in inpatient treatment centers, but this first one was pretty significant. Like I said, I was 17 years old, and my first three months at this inpatient treatment center in Sioux City, Iowa, um, it was okay, it wasn't really changing my life or anything, but one day, um, I get a call from my counselor, and she tells me she had somebody on the phone who wanted to talk to me, and it was my dad. And he was calling just to tell me, hey, son, uh, I'm moving to a treatment center that's about an hour away from where you are. I'm going to call you once a week. I'll come see you every other week. And you know what? He kept his word, and he did just that. And so I'm convinced I'm getting my dad back. And it was uh, a pretty big deal. Three months later, we end up, I'm, I'm graduating this program. I think he was already in his halfway house at this point. But as I'm graduating this program, both my dad and my mom show up to be there at the same time. 
And for them to be in the same room was unbelievable to me. And all of a sudden, you start getting these couple of thoughts. Man, I wonder if they're going to be getting back together. You know, dad takes us out to ice cream at the Sioux City Mall afterwards. And, you know, mom and dad are sitting down talking. And as any normal 17-year-old boy, the first thing I did was run over to FYE. And I went to go listen to some music for a little while while they sat down and talked. And getting caught up on all the music I'd been missing out on for the last six months. Because, you know, you got to get your priorities right. And so... Uh, it's time for my dad to head back to his halfway house, so he walks me and my mom back out to our car. And as I go sit down, uh, as I'm about to open my door to sit down in the car, my dad looks me in the eye and he says, Michael, I wish I was coming with you. And little did I know that those would be the last words that I would ever hear from my father again, because a week from that day, he committed suicide. I was over at one of my friend's house when I heard, and I wasn't clean and sober. In fact, I used the first night uh, I got home from that treatment. But once I found out that my dad had committed suicide, it was all over from that point. I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about anyone. And I didn't really care if I got caught doing anything. In fact, it was not even a week from me finding out that he committed suicide that my mom ended up finding me and one of my friends down in the basement smoking some weed because I wasn't even caring about covering anything up anymore. It's just who I was, and I didn't care who knew. And so from that point, I got sent to my second inpatient treatment center, and I was there for three months. And after this place, I kind of wanted to do right. And so I decided not to move back to Des Moines, so I stayed out in Boone, Iowa, um, because the treatment was in Ames, and they had the little partnership with Boone. And so I stayed out there for another three months, went to NA meetings, AA meetings, two meetings a day, you know, really just committed myself to those two things. And you know what? As long as I was in a meeting, I was good. But the second I was out of a meeting, I still had all of my thoughts, all of my feelings, everything that was not dealt with was still inside of my heart. And nobody ever taught me how to deal with those things. We always talked about the outside things, never about what's going on on the inside. And so I was tired after a long day of work, sitting outside of my apartment, smoking a cigarette. And I look over to my right, and there's my neighbor. My neighbor's outside smoking a joint. And he looked at me and asked me, do you smoke? And I said, well, yeah. So I go over there and I start smoking with him and we finish the joint and he invites me inside. And as we go inside, um, he ends up pointing to the counter. And all of a sudden, right after completing this program and doing so well in AA and NA and all of these things, I find myself right back in this addiction that I just couldn't escape. And so... From there, I decided to move back to Des Moines. Obviously, Boone wasn't this magical place that was going to save my life. It turns out that I followed myself everywhere that I went. And so I figured I'd go back to what's comfortable, and that was Des Moines. Once I got back to Des Moines, um, I didn't really spend much time living inside of my home. Uh, just ended up running around doing whatever I wanted. Ended up meeting this girl, and her dad was a big meth dealer in Des Moines, and so we had a big connection, and all of our life was spent going couch to couch, living out of my car, never really coming home, never really doing anything with my life, never really working, not finding any success, just staying as high as I could for as long as I could, and then sleeping for a few days until somebody brought some more dope for me to get high again. And that was my life for the next two years. I end up going to jail twice. G Gary, if you want to throw that up there. That was the second time that I got arrested. Uh, I got busted with an eight ball of methamphetamine coming from Ankeny to Des Moines. I ended up getting arrested. That would have been two years on the anniversary of when my dad committed suicide. And sitting in, behind those bars, knowing what day it was and everything that I was missing, uh, that was a big reality check for me. But even that didn't change my mind. It just dug my depression into a deeper hole. And at this point, um, there was a lot of things going on. A lot of things were changing. And I can start, see God to start seeing God working at this point. You see, my girlfriend at the time ended up moving down to Missouri because she wanted to get away from the dope and everything that was going on in Des Moines. I wasn't ready to make that choice yet. I stuck around for a little while longer. Well, as I stuck around for... Uh, watching my best friend get arrested for conspiracy to manufacture methamphetamine and his mom and his sister were left inside of my car homeless with me 
we ended up pooling together all of the money that we had and ended up being able to get a room at the Motel Relax off of Hickman. And we were there for just like two or three nights because two or three nights in, my best friend's sister's boyfriend got the cops called on us twice in one night and we lost our deposit, we lost our room, and we were left out on the streets. And all I had was the dope I had in my pocket. I did gas runs, I did everything that I could to try to keep gas in our car because it's about December at this time. And for the next two weeks, I'm calling different pastors on the phone, pastors I'd never even met before, begging for them to pay for a room for us to be able to have at motels. Two or three nights, we were able to pull that off. But eventually, we got to the point where all of our resources had run out, and I was out of money, I was out of dope, and more importantly, I was out of gas and out of hope. And I ended up at the Motel 8 parking lot over off of Hubble between Altoona and the east side. And I walk into the motel manager's office and I ask him, I beg him for a room for us to be able to stay. And he said, there's nothing I can do for you. And I remember walking back out to my car defeated at this point. I had absolutely no hope left in my life. In fact, I thought I was just going to die there that night. My grandpa could tell you the exact date. I'd say it was December 14th. Is that right? December 14th um, was this day, and it was the day that I made a decision. I started to look around at my circumstances, and I started to see that not only was I going to kill myself living this way, but I was going to kill these people that I said I loved trying to be their savior when I couldn't even save myself. And so this was the moment in time where in tears, I just began to look up at the sky and felt the need to call my grandpa and ask for another chance. I got on the phone with my grandpa and he said, Michael, you can get over here, but this is the last time we can try to help you. We've done this route before and we ain't going to do it again. You can come here. We're going to Teen Challenge. That is the plan for you. And this is the last opportunity. This is the last chance. And I said, that's the only one I need because I was ready this time. I wanted to change because I knew that I couldn't do it on my own anymore. And so God actually did a pretty cool miracle. Remember, I told you I was out of gas. My car was on E. I ended up getting on the phone, making another call to be able to find a place for my best friend's mom and sister to be able to stay for the next couple of weeks. And God opened up that door, and he also gave my car enough gas while it was on E to drive all the way from the east side to drop them off and also get all the way to Johnston to my grandparents' home. And so I'm basically just pushing my car into the driveway as I'm getting there. That thing was completely out of gas, and it was a miracle I even made it. And two weeks from that day, on December 23rd of 2013, I came into Teen Challenge. Gary, go ahead and put that next picture up. I did my last shot of meth 45 minutes before I walked in the door and basically gave my grandpa a heart attack on my way in. But I made it to Teen Challenge. Um, my first day at Teen Challenge was kind of a blur. It turns out going into the program high is a really poor choice, and it doesn't feel so good. I managed to get myself to sleep that night, and I woke up the next morning, and all of a sudden, reality really started to sink in because my first full day at Teen Challenge was December 24th of 2013, and that, if you guys know your calendar real well, is Christmas Eve. And so at 19 years old, I'm waking up surrounded by about 50 other guys on the fourth floor dorm in a bunk bed, and I'm tired. I don't want to talk to anybody, and it was Christmas. I was like, why did I agree to come before Christmas? Why couldn't I have sat through the holidays with my family and then come to Teen Challenge? Well, because God had some different plans for me. Something really cool happened to me on Christmas Eve of 2013. We had a chapel service in the morning, Monday through Friday. We have a chapel service every morning at Teen Challenge. And this morning was no different. I sat in the fourth row, which is the farthest row back. You can sit if you're a student. And I was sitting right by the pillar. And I told you guys, I grew up in church, and so I had this all figured out. I knew exactly how this service was going to go. We would stand up, sing three songs. Somebody would talk at me for like 45 minutes, and then I'd go on about my day. Well, God had different plans that morning. Uh, when worship music was put on, I didn't stand up. I just sat there. And the first song that came on that morning was I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me. And that was one of the three songs they played at my dad's funeral. And I just began to weep. Now, I was not a crier. In fact, I was really ashamed that tears were coming out of my eyes because at 19 years old, being the youngest guy there, surrounded by a bunch of grown men, the last first impression that I wanted to make was that I was a crier or a crybaby because I was a man. 
I'm 19, I don't have feelings, but I couldn't hold the tears back because God was doing something inside of my heart. Now, I didn't grow up in a church where we had altars or where you come forward to pray or anything, but I started connecting the dots that this is what you do here at Teen Challenge, and I saw a bunch of guys up there praying, and I didn't go up there to pray. To be honest with you, I was just going up there to hide my face, but I didn't do a really good job of that. It was one of those mornings where you're crying, and it's not just a cry. It's more like an ugly cry where you're, <laughs> you know, just sitting there gasping for breath, snot all over your arm. Can't really hide that from anybody. And so... I'm up there doing that, and next thing you know, I stand up, turn around, and there was 15 guys there praying for me, laying hands on me, hugging me, looking me in the eye, telling me they love me. I hadn't had somebody tell me they love me other than my family. Hardly ever. At least when they did it, all they wanted was whatever I had in my pocket, or they wanted me to do something for them. Nobody ever loved me just for, just for who I am. And all of a sudden, there's something really different that began to happen inside of my life. And all of a sudden, a brand new perspective was given to me because it wasn't about what I did or who I was. I was good enough just the way I am for the first time in my life. I didn't need anything to earn your love, your approval, or your acceptance. I was good enough just the way I am. And that blew my mind. See, from that moment on, there were a lot of cool things that have happened in my life. I want to make sure I touch on them all. So I completed the program on February 2nd of 2015, and completing the program wasn't enough for me. In fact, just to tell you a little side story, uh, two months into the program, God the girlfriend who I had when I went into the program and knew that going back to that relationship was not going to be good for me. The relationship was toxic, and it was just going to drag me down. Uh, and I wanted everything that God had for me, even if it meant not having her. And so I ended up giving up that relationship in Brandon's office, made a phone call, um, broke that relationship off, and it was one of the hardest things I had to do, but it ended up giving me one of the greatest rewards I've ever gotten. You see, it set the stage for what was going to happen for me in my future. That moment set the stage for me. All of a sudden, where I laid down my plan, where I laid down my agenda, where I laid down all of my good intentions and said, God, I don't have a clue of how to live my life. And obviously I've messed it up from this point on and I guess I'll continue to do that forever. God, I don't care what your plan looks like. I'm ready to do it your way. And it wasn't just a, maybe a couple weeks from that day, God gave me a vision and he showed me uh, teaching lecture classes at Teen Challenge. He showed me mentoring students inside of an office. He showed me facilitating Ultimate Journey, which is a small group where we go and basically go through every memory of your life from the time you were an infant to the time you are now. And all of a sudden, I started to see this awesome purpose out in front of me. And I had never had a purpose in my life, and I didn't even know what it looked like, but I knew it excited me. I didn't know how, it, how I was going to get there. But I figured if God was good enough to show me, then he was good enough to make it happen. And so by committing to him and following him, I committed to come back to Teen Challenge after I completed the program. Uh, and I did my internship there. So that was February 2nd of 2015. I ended up graduating Teen Challenge uh, in June of 2016. And it was about this time that I committed to go to theology school. Now, I didn't just wake up one day and decide to go to theology school. I actually made myself really miserable before I got there. There's a picture of me graduating. But before me getting there, uh, I had come to this place in my internship where I had become an advisor. That's mentoring students in the offices. I had taught some lecture classes, and I facilitated Ultimate Journey. And it was like one of those moments where I felt like I arrived. It's like, what else is out in front of me? What else do I have to do? And I got comfortable and just kind of settled in. And whenever I get comfortable, I find out that it's really not all that comfortable. It's actually kind of miserable. Whenever there's nothing out in front of you and you kind of settle for what you have, it's not a fun place to be, but that's the place where I got. And I was sitting there working at this RV place and I was detailing it and it was hot summer day. AC didn't work inside of the RV we were detailing. I was sitting there with a rag cleaning all the edges of the window, making it perfect and really starting to question God like, is this all there is, God? Is this all you have for me? And he asked me a really funny question. I don't know if God ever responds to your questions with a question, but he's like, 
well, when were you going to ask me? You know? And it's like this light bulb went off in my head, and it's like God's been patiently waiting to tell me what's in front of me for so long, but yet I never asked. I just expected it to kind of happen. And that's not how God works. See, he wanted to live in relationship with me, and he wanted me to ask him. He's a good father, and he always gives us what we ask. The problem is we don't seek him, we don't knock, and we, when we don't seek, knock, or we don't find you know, and so I learned a very valuable lesson in that moment. Continue to ask what's in front. God, what do you have next for me? He said, I'm glad you finally asked. I want you to go to theology school. Now, at this point in time, I thought that going to theology school was something that was just going to help me be a better staff member at Teen Challenge. Uh, my plan for the rest of my life is to serve in the ministry of Teen Challenge, and I want to do it to the best of my ability. And if going to school was going to end up completing... I uh, got an A on everything that I ever did in theology school, and if you ask my mom, I bet she's never seen an A come across a report card that's been in front of her face ever in her life when it has my name on it, and so it was pretty amazing. What? P.E. That's the only A I ever got, P.E. Real good at that. And so end up doing real well in theology school, and after completing, end up uh, having a really cool opportunity. Um, and I want to tell you about a quick story. So as I'm going through theology school, about halfway through, actually, to tell you the truth, it really began a year after I completed Teen Challenge. See, part of an internship at Teen Challenge, there's a commitment to stay at CLA for that year. Uh, number one is to stay connected to good accountability for that year, because guess what? Guys, just because you complete Teen Challenge doesn't mean you're fixed. Sorry. We're going to be working on ourselves for the rest of our life, continuing to find out what God wants to do in our heart. But So completing Teen Challenge was step number one, but staying in accountability so that I can continue to get my feet under me was necessary. And so I was committed to CLA. And at the end of my internship, I started to explore my options and say, God, where do you want me to go to church? And I thought that was a really humble question of me to ask. And as I was getting with God, I was like, God, where do you want me to go to church? I was like, God, I want to find a wife. I want to be able to find new friends who are my age. And I feel like I could do that better at a different church. Where do you want me to go? Like that was some really humble question, right? And, uh, he was like, Michael, very simply, why would you go to another church to find the very thing that I can bring directly to you? Very simply, what he taught me that day was, Michael, you are to grow where you're planted. You are to grow where you're planted. And through that time in prayer, God ended up giving me a vision for this young adult group. And about a year from that day after I stuck with CLA, um, I had a good friend of mine who decided he wanted to be a part of developing this young adult group here. And so we developed it. And as we were talking about what it would look like, he said, Michael, um, look at us. We are a couple of young 20-year-old guys who want to start a co-ed young adult group. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but just being a couple of young guys in a co-ed young adult group leading it can make situations pretty weird if you don't have another woman in leadership with you. And so I asked somebody if they would do it, and they said no. But Jared ended up asking Natalie. And by the grace of God, she said yes. Now, I'd been at CLA for a few years at this point. I was doing sound booth many mornings. And so as I was up there at the sound booth, Natalie's always the pretty girl up front. And you always see her right here raising her hands. And that's the one where you kind of circle and you go, out of your league, buddy. Don't even try. And so at this point in my life, I didn't even approach her to talk to her. She was that girl that was too good for me to talk to. I would have bad intentions just saying hello. And so I kept a distance knowing that, man, it's just not going to happen. Don't do it. But God kind of forced his hand on that and said, well, you guys are going to lead this young adult group together. And so that was such a cool experience for us because instead of us just rushing into some kind of relationship, we had months where we were able to develop just a friendship between us, getting to know each other. Uh, getting a foundation set, not rushing into loving each other and having these crazy feelings, but learning who each other are before we ever get into that point. And so through being able to do the young adult group together and getting to know each other, I learned that really quickly I had some really crazy feelings for her. And because my ways never really work out, you know, I talked to my mom, my stepdad, my grandpa, my grandma. I talked to 
Pastor Mike and Roger Freeborn, and I had six people praying with me. Roger can tell you about a time that I was in his apartment till about midnight seeking the Lord because I couldn't go to sleep because I was so freaked out about the feelings I had. And so he talked me off the cliff and helped pray and pray. And he's like, God told me something, Michael. I said, what did he say? He said, I'm not supposed to tell you until two weeks. I said, you <laughs> said, come on, man, that doesn't help me sleep. Yeah, let's talk about it in two weeks. Let's pray about it for two weeks. Let's not make an emotional decision. But eventually we got to the place where it was, uh, everybody was feeling peace about it. And so I went to ask her. And so I still don't know why to this day, but she said yes. Um, she actually prayed about it for a week. She said, I got some feelings for you too, but why don't I pray about it for a week and I'll get back to you next week and we'll talk about uh, whether or not this is something we should do. And that was the most encouraging thing I ever heard. She didn't say no, so, <laughs> so I thought it was a pretty good deal. And so she says yes, and we got to enter into courtship together. And then on July 7th of 2018, Natalie and I were able to get married. And so... I think that's a pretty cool picture. So I was able to get married to the love of my life, and things have been going pretty well since then. Uh, we got a baby on the way. We'll get to find out what gender. Yeah. We'll find out the gender here in about a month. So stay tuned. There's more exciting news on the way. So as I look throughout the theme of my life, uh, there's one thing that stands out to me. And from the earliest of my memories, the enemy tried to convince me that I wasn't good enough. And because I believed I wasn't good enough, man, I didn't even try. I gave up. I accepted that as truth. And every decision I made from that point forward was to try to prove that lie wrong. And guys, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. There's not a thing that I could do to prove myself to be good, good enough. There's not a thing I could do. In my first month at Teen Challenge, I came across a really powerful verse. And it's one of those verses where, I don't know if you guys have ever had this experience, but when I read this verse, this verse I felt like was written exactly for me. Ri written exactly for me. Gary, go ahead and put that up. This is Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. God is the father of the fatherless and protector of widows and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. See, for many years of my life, I decided to be rebellious. I decided to ignore God. I ran away from the church. I didn't want anything to do with him. I didn't want to talk about him. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to hear what my family had to say about this God because I tried God. It didn't work. I tried it when I was 12. You have everything figured out when you're 12, right? And so I figured out he doesn't work. Um, and so I rebelled against him, and I found myself in a parched land. And it was at the point where I realized that all of my resources, all of my time, all of my energy, everything that I had focused myself on, all of my dreams and aspirations to that point had failed me. And I was finally willing to admit that I don't have this figured out. God, I'm going to give you a chance. And so I came across this verse, and I told you guys about my dad committing suicide. So when I read this verse that God is the father to the fatherless, something really started to connect with me. It really started to connect with me. And I started realizing that there is a special, special relationship that God wants to have with me personally. See, a father provides leadership, guidance, direction. Anybody familiar with the saying, you know, man, that son, man, that kid, he, he acts just like his father. I feel like we hear that about so many people. You're going to grow up to be just like your father, right? Well, at that point in my life, I had grown up to be just like him, except I went on the fast track where he was in his 30s or so by the time he was in his first inpatient treatment center. I was, 19, I was 17. I was on the fast track to it. But see, at this moment, God sent me an invitation. 
And he said, Michael, I want to be your father. And I want you to be my son. And see, in that moment, my identity began to change. All of a sudden, as I got into the word, and I started to realize who God is and realize that that same invitation was available for me, that my life I could grow up learning to be like him, all of a sudden, there was a purpose out in front of me. All of a sudden, as God began to father me, I began to find out who I was. I learned that, man, if I'm God's son, I'm more than good enough. I'm royalty. It, it began to redefine every aspect of the way that I saw myself and the lies of the enemy no more had a hold on my life. And I was able to see myself the way that he created me to be. See, a lot of us in life go through that same exact thing. We try to find our identity in the things that we do. Workaholics going out working 60, 80 hours a week find their identity inside of work. They find their ide identity in being provider. And eventually, all of us retire someday. For those who have found their identity in work, when you retire, what's your identity going to be? A lot of guys fall apart when that moment comes and don't know what to do because work has defined them all of their life. Athletes. Athletes find their identity in sports and their performance. An athlete's prime goes to 28 maybe. Some if they're lucky until their mid-30s. What does an athlete do after the age of 35 when, man, sports isn't really all your life is about anymore? What's your identity then? You see, there's so many different things in life that we try to base our identity off of. I am an athlete. I am a hard worker. I am all of these things. But anything inside of this world, no matter how good it may seem, if we base our identity on it, we will fall flat on our face because any, any identity we find in this world is temporary. But God has an invitation to all of us. See, all of us are called to be sons and daughters of the King. Jesus said today, I no longer call you servants, but friends. And he calls us sons as well. He calls us sons and daughters of the king. And as we get established inside of that identity, nobody can strip that away from us. See, today I get to be a youth pastor. I get to be a staff member at Teen Challenge. But those things don't define me. But because I'm a son, I'm able to step into those different purposes. I'm able to, able to pastor people. I'm able to mentor people. Those aren't my identities. Those are the things that because I'm a son, I'm able to do. But it's from the foundation of being a son. You see, none of us are defined. None of us are defined by what we do. It's who we are. We are defined by who he created us to be. So, Father, we come to you this morning so thankful, grateful for the invitation that you have sent to us. God, you have called us your sons and your daughters. And this morning, we come to you to break off every lie that the enemy has placed on our life. Lord Jesus, all of the various things that we try to find our identity in, whether it be money, work, whether it be our whether it be sports, whether it be any of things, relationships, God, we break off all of those identities right now, God, because we know that they are worthless and won't get us anywhere. God, I pray that you would take all of us to a place of knowing our identity in you, who you have said we are, and not the people that we have created ourselves to be. We love you so much, King Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.